Welcome to Captured by Women, the all-women host show which dissects current affairs from the perspectives of women. I am Sarah Safwaje, and I'm joined here with my co-hosts. I am Nansa Tayaku, a development consultant. I am Elizabeth Olympia Emanuel, a restaurateur. In this episode of Captured by Women, the Electoral Commission at a news conference has exonerated its officials of any wrongdoing in the, during the 2018 referendum on the creation of six new regions. In our second discussion today, we are looking at the umpers that occurred at the University of Education, Winneba, where the former Vice Chancellor, Professor Mauto Avoke, has asked the University Council to reinstate him, insisting an Economic Organized Crime Office report has exonerated him and absolved him of any wrongdoing. Meanwhile, there is simmering tension within the fishing community in Ghana. This is due to an announcement posted by the Ministry of Fishing and Aquaculture Development that there will be a closed season from May 15th to June 15th. We will get some answers from the Chief Director of the Ministry. The spin is up next when we return. <laughs> The Electoral Commission has exonerated its officials of any wrongdoing in a video that went viral on social media during the 2018 referendum on the creation of six new regions. Electoral Commission officials were accused of thumbprinting ballot papers multiple times. The EC said its internal investigations revealed that the culprits were not EC officials and they want the police to arrest the perpetrators. Ladies, what are your thoughts on this? I think that for any well-structured organization, when they have differences or when there's a challenge, they probably have an internal setup that you will use to first investigate to what extent. And in this case, it's more peculiar because for the EC, they actually employ the people who go out to do the work. It's not like an external body. These were EC officials. So they would have been in the know to authenticate whether these people were indeed employees or they were other citizens, or they were third party people contracted as polling assistants at the stations. So I think in this case, uh, part of the investigation probably could be undertaken by the EC, but I'm not sure to what extent, uh, you know, they yes. can go and, and I'm, I'm thinking more about whether you would want to look at the police maybe partnering them to an extent, or the police being the ones to take the investigation. I have, I have no well, idea I, I about think they are, how this they are should be. Within their rights gone, to yeah. ask the police to take the case going forward. Okay. If there's been a video showing alleged EC officials thumbprinting, and the EC have somehow been able to identify them and clearly come out to say they are not their employees, then it's definitely a police matter because they were impersonating yes. EC officials. But, but that brings another question. At the polling stations, is there video coverage? Is there CCTV? What is the setup of uh, a polling oh, station? No, there's not oh, no. CCTV. There's, there's Some of them. Then it most likely this was staged or set up because someone who would have a video. These days, anyone with a camera yeah, phone can, is, can make a everybody video. Everybody's a photographer. That, is, that, that is quite so true. That works. I think what the EC has come out with to say in. in, in, in in the different instances, to the, to the best of my knowledge from the press conference that was made, was that the, they had certain security features that do not appear in those particular videos. For instance, this time around for the referendum, the referendum they did not have ID cards for officials. They rather had jackets. And these jackets yes. were made in a certain and particular manner, issued to specific people that they could trace. So that was one thing that made them know straight away that that's uh, some out. of the videos. And then for some of the papers that you could see being uh, time printed, the, the new EC logo and the coat of arms were not on it. Now, the new EC logo, we know that everybody knows the new EC logo because of the... the, the the, the way mana the bruja the, that came around, around it. yes around so everybody it. knows how the easy logo looks like anyway yeah. so that's one of the, the the things that they talked about then they even went further to say that the videos also did not have location and time so for instance if you are voting in ot region right the video could show um 
the, car, the town, a close town or whatever. You know how when you take a video, you can say Accra or Osu, currently in Osu or whatever. It takes it and has a date. They didn't have dates. They didn't have time. They didn't have anything but on them. We were just, you that know, is, That bare. is a so, feature you can actually turn off. Yes. Yeah, so, well, so that, if that means that phone. people could be mischievous because if you really want to state your yeah. case, then you make sure that all those features are on to say that, yes, I was really there and this, you know, and this happened. So they've been a bit of back and forth about, about how authentic those videos are and whether they were staged or... Yeah. But what or is no. also concerning is, is why did the video go viral? It went viral because... As a nation, we seem to have lost confidence in the EC. Their I, reputation is well, a little... I, yeah. I think that I think the, the more worrying question is, why do we not want to believe the EC? I think I, I, I would... It's the you same question, question, but I would rather... Okay, so you're agreeing that, that why, we don't really have people, confidence in the EC? Yes, why are why, people why questioning you know, this? Why are people thinking that there should be some truth in those videos? rather than believing or agreeing entirely that they've really done some forensic and they've come out with, with facts to show that these are not videos that can be substantiated in any in, uh, in way. I know it's only one person that they, they said had, I think, time and data when they asked the person, the person said, oh, they were just excited and so decided to be thumb printing some papers to show their support. But it was just one, one thumb print that he kind of replicated to make it look that's what uh, it means, and that's the only person I know they've questioned or something. Even that, that person, I have no that person idea, should be questioned you know, further. Uh, yeah. And things like that. But they, they, they are also making the case that at this point, it is the police that should actually take yeah. over the case. These happenings, these events will certainly have an effect on the 2020 elections if they are not properly addressed. So if like the press conference that was recently um, had a few days ago, they invited the police to take over the investigations. I think the police should be up and doing as usual and get to the bottom of it. So if there is some, some crime that has been committed, it should be tackled and the perpetrators dealt with. However, if there's, there's no one and it was a staged affair, they should even find those who staged this because this is just denting the image of the EC and we shouldn't allow that to happen. It's one of our bodies that we are highly respected and maintain the democracy and peace in this country. We should avoid anything like this happening in 2020. Yeah, I, I think so because technology has the capacity to cause a lot of disruptions. And disruption can be positive disruption or negative disruption. If you use disruption, for instance, in technology to vote, to help voters, to reach voters, anything like that, that's positive. But you can yeah. also use it to... to, to, to make sure that it's chaotic. If people are able to cause this kind of mischief, they cause this kind of mischief and are, are let go, then there are problems. Because, like as we said before, everybody who has a phone with a camera now mm -hmm. it has the capacity to be able to do a lot of things. Yeah. What if this is not checked? And then on a larger scale, you know, we it's have this. Can planning. you imagine listening to results coming in from regions and then hearing that OEC oh, officials were busy thumb printing or some other person shows a ballot box and all. So we need to make sure that these people are brought to book, the issue is addressed and then we don't leave things yeah. hanging. So it's, it's up to the EC to push it through, to make sure the police do what they are supposed to what do. They're supposed to. Coming up next on Captured by Women is the dismissal of the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba. We will be back after the break. Coming up next on Captured by Women is the dismissal of the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Winneba, Professor Mauto Avoke. Professor Mauto Avoke has resurfaced and asked the University Council to reinstate him, insisting an Economic Organized Crime Office report has absolved him of any wrongdoing. The Governing Council of the University of Education Winneba in August 2018 dismissed Professor Avoke and four other principal officers of the university after a fact-finding committee found them guilty of procurement infractions. On Tuesday, the professor, in an interaction with the media, demanded that he be allowed to complete the unexpired term. According to him, he is left with six months to complete his tenure in office. 
Joining us today on Captured by Women is the PRO, Public Relations Officer of the University of Education, Winneba, Mr. Ernest Edu Avortiga. Ernest, you're welcome to Captured by Women. Thanks for having me on your platform. What is the situation at the University of Winneba with regards to the chaos that recently we recently witnessed? Has calm returned? Um, thank you very much once again, and uh, uh, my regards to your descending viewers. I think that uh, we have to take this on two levels. Uh, there is the academic side of it, and there is also the reconciliation processes that have been initiated. Um, the disturbances, of course, uh, through the schedules of the school overboard. And so there was the need to realign the uh, schedules of the school. Uh, there was the need to also bring peace and calm on campus before we could restart academic work and have things going. And so somewhere on the 18th of March, council had a press conference after which they issued a statement to explain what had happened and to give uh, people, the Ghanaian people, up to date on what uh, had taken place so far. They explained in that press conference the processes that led to uh, the disciplinary measures that were taken against the affected persons and um, took the stand that uh, the decisions they took were right, they were in accordance with the rules and uh, regulations that govern the university. However, on the back of whatever had happened, uh, of course, the, the, the last thing that triggered the whole thing was the disciplinary measures that were taken against three uh, staff of the university. Uh, for whom some students uh, decided to go on demonstration in solidarity with those three. Now, um, it didn't involve the entire student body. It was one department. Uh, we call it uh, the Department of um, Health, Physical Education and Recreation, HIPES. The level 400 students of that department uh, decided to uh, solidarize with one of their lecturers who was part of the affected three. And so they went on a peaceful demonstration. They started on Monday. Uh, it went through to Thursday where we had an escalation which eventually uh, resulted in the distractions that were reported. Now, so they explained and said that they took that decision in accordance with a uh, due process. However, on the back of what had happened and the fact that there were a lot of pleas coming from Ghanaians, well-meaning people, the clergy, traditional authority and all that, even though they took that decision, they were also now uh, in a position to reconsider giving everything, to give peace a chance and also to reconcile uh, the university. And that they gave the direction. The direction was that anyone who felt so affected by their decision could petition them if they so wish so that they could review. But what they weren't going to take was a class uh, petition. They weren't going to make any decision uh, to cover a group because the reason that the offenses that those people who were affected uh, committed differed in terms of mm -hmm. degree and in terms of the uh, veracity of it. And so they will consider every case on its own merit. And so if, as an affected person, you made a case, they looked at it, and if it merits that they should review their decision, they would review. Now, subsequent to that, uh, the council wrote to uh, courts because there were a number of uh, court cases against the university uh, between the affected persons and the university. And so council wrote for adjournment so that all the affected people could have the fair opportunity to appeal to uh, uh, council. And so that was part of the uh, peace building process and then the reconciliation measures that were uh, uh, put in place. Now, between that time and, 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 and some time, we, we had spent about two, three weeks and mm -hmm. the school was not back on session and council also took the position that the students were going to suffer uh, because majority of them did not even know uh, what was going on until they finally heard some of these things and some of the students actually attacked them and chased them out of the uh, classes and so it wasn't fair that uh, they, they, they are kept at home for a very long time and they suffer. 
So on the back of that, and again, appeals from well-meaning people and all, the council decided that the three people whose action immediately led to the disruption should be pardoned and reinstated. Mm -hmm. And so council pardoned them and reinstated them. So what is the university's the position on the vi former vice chancellor's demands? You are smiling. <laughs> <laughs> tough questions. Uh, it's not a tough question. It's an interesting question. Okay. <laughs> uh, interesting in the sense that um, the vice chancellor is making this uh, demand based on two things. The first thing is that uh, he says that there is a uh, Yoko report that has exonerated mm -hmm. him. And he also says that there was a court ruling that also uh, exonerated him. I think that the facts are not exactly right. Uh, the vice chancellor was not dismissed based on an Yoko report or a court order. His dismissal was occasioned by the findings of the governing council's fact-finding committee, which report cited, indicted, and cited him for some uh, breaches, and for which reason council had to constitute, according to our uh, rules, constitute a disciplinary board to uh, subject him to some further interrogation because he had questions to answer, uh, after which, if it became necessary, would sanction him. Now, when the disciplinary board was set up, he declined to uh, meet the disciplinary board on the grounds that uh, he was already in court. And so, whilst he was in court, he could not come for that internal processes to be included. Now, per our rules, again, when you are invited like that and you decline the offer, the board can go on and do their work. With offer. you in absentia. In absentia. So, that was, so that's not a fair trial then, because he wasn't there to discuss the issues. Fantastic. He was given the opportunity, all the room to come and discuss the issues. But it was his choice not to his come. Choice. But then who he was, he was he in court with? Who was the court? Was the it not with the university? With the university. So how did that process work? Did the university go to court? Or the university also decided they wouldn't meet him in court? No. The university was going to court. So the investor went to court, met him, the and then the court was ruled. going to court, meeting him. The, the matter is still pending in court. court. So yeah. the investor, it was in parallel. It was an internal, internal process. Internal organization. Usually, and then when you have a situation like that, you exhaust the internal channel before, before you go okay. to court. But so he opted external. to go to court. Let, yes. let, me, let me ask this question. When the Iyoko committee findings came up, did those ones reflect the term of reference for the university fact finding? The issues that were raised by the university internal process were some of them subject of the investigation by Yoko or not? You see, that Yoko report, um, we as a university did not make any formal complaint to Yoko to investigate anyone. Mm -hmm. We don't, as I speak to you, have a copy of that report. We don't know the content of the report. So who initiated the Yoko call? That is report? a question, Yoko. The Yoko investigation. Yes, that is a does, question. Does Yoko, Yoko need a mandate? Uh, does it need to be requested, made a request to before it undertakes a, an investigation? I think it's an independent body that when they smell something foul, they could, or you could petition them like Shraj to investigate your case? So who petitioned them? That's yeah, what we that now, Okay, so now we need to find, do you know who petitioned the I Yoko? don't know, unless you are get you, that Are you presupposing us to believe that the university does not recognize that Yoko report? Is that what you are saying? We don't know about that report. The only time we have heard something is what is being discussed in the in media. In the media. So you, so you as PRO, you don't have a copy? I don't have. He, my the chairman I'll of governing council does not have a copy. <laughs> how much more? So you went. So who did Iyoko come to? How did they carry out the investigation? Because the university would have definitely been in charge. They didn't come to the university to talk to any professors or uh, whatever. I, I they were they were in the so university. So per whose. 
by whose uh, uh, collaboration or whatever invitation were they on the campuses of UEW to conduct the investigation? That I don't know. Yoko should be in a position yes. to. I think if Yoko knocks on your door, you just open. You, yeah, just, you just have to open. Yeah, yeah, but there should still be a process because if he's PR when he speaks for the university and he's saying he has no idea how they came there, how the report is, then that in itself no, he has, he's means something. He's saying that he has not seen the report. Yeah, but he has no idea how they came to the campus in the first place. Oh, they came I think to they campus. Every Monday the, that yes, so. this thing was there. They would yes. have written that we are coming to investigate. But we don't know who initiated that. And they haven't process. seen a copy of the report. Probably if there's something in the media and they hear there's something that. Uh, no, but that's, to that's a bit economic because <laughs> if if Professor Avoke is saying that Ioko has cleared him of anything that he was being accused of. And so that's a premise for him to ask for reinstatement. And you, are, as PRO, is saying you haven't even seen the, the report. IOCO report. So you are telling me that in his application for reinstatement, he will have to actually even attach a copy of the IOCO. You see, the uh, IOCO report was if, not if, based if, if, on if you must get IOCO it, his findings. The was not yes. based let's, let's on the IOCO. Let's say PRO, let the PRO. It's not based I'm, on the IOCO I'm findings. trying to arrive at a it's point. It's based on yes, the government council's fact finding exactly. committee. And I, ask and you. I also want to make mm -hmm. clear yes. that Yoko has investigated and has come up with a report does not invalidate the work of the fact finding committee. Granted. However, the TROs that were, the TORs that were in the fact finding committee, were they also covered by Yoko? Which is what you are saying you don't know. I don't know. You have no idea. I have so no my, idea. My, my question still holds valid because if he says Iyoko has cleared, he definitely will serve a copy of what the fact-finding committee was going to, to do. Yoko. Even no, though he Yoko. didn't attend. Yoko. No, Professor Avoke was, no, yes. uh -huh. was served with a copy of what the fact-finding committee was going to do, even if he didn't attend. And Iyoko, he would have also been in the know of what they went. So if he is saying Iyoko has cleared him of all the wrongdoings you are saying, you are presupposing that Iyoko's report cannot override that of the fact-finding exactly. committee of the university. That's exactly. what I want you to exactly. say. Exactly. So in this case, how legitimate are Professor Avokes' uh, uh, demands? Yes, okay. how are they? Tell us. So I say that it's, it's premature because uh, the basis for which he is asking to for be reinstatement. Uh, reinstated does not exist. The second thing he talked about is the court ruling. Now, the court ruling was actually for the Supreme Court to set aside a default judgment that was given by the Winneba High Court. Now, what it was is this. Um, the Winneba High Court made a ruling without giving uh, the affected party, Professor Avoke, and the affected people the opportunity to give a verbal evidence okay. at court. And so it gave the ruling based on the pleas that they had what entered. And they said that it wasn't fair. Since the matter affected them, they should have been given the opportunity to give that oral evidence. And so the court ruled that since they weren't given that opportunity, um, they overturned the, the, the Winneba High Court ruling and asked them to go back to initiate. And when you have been asked to go back and start something, is it clearance? No, now, it in that same judgment, the, the Supreme Court made clear that since the ruling borders on the governance of the university for the avoidance of doubt, it does not affect anything the governing council had done because the governing council was properly constituted and acted within the remits of uh, its law. So his, 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 uh, his demands are not legitimate. Not so at no, all. So as it stands, he's not going to be reinstated. That's what you're saying. I cannot preempt that process mm -hmm. because the governing council has opened a window of opportunity for all the affected people to petition it if they so wish. Now, if he decides to take that route, and uh, since there is something in the Yoko report, he backs it with the Yoko report and brings it to the governing council and they consider and see that there is something in it. And for which reason they would reinstate him, that is up to them. But as it stands now, uh, there is no basis for the demands that he is making. Okay. So if Professor Avoke will not be reinstated, Currently, what why is all the <laughs> why is all the other bruhaha about the current vice chancellor as well? We are hearing calls for ah, yes, resignation of the current vice chancellor. We are hearing that the MP for Efutu has some kind of hold on the university. I have no idea. Is he on the university council? Why do we 
hear this in the media that the MP has some influence in why Professor Avoke was let go, and now he's actually supporting Professor Avoke to come back, and then the current uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, VC is also embroiled in uh, some kind of, you know, what's all that also about? Um, you have heard that, and uh, to some extent, uh, there, there is some uh, evidence to, to back that. But that is a question the MP can better answer. But in any case, he is not on the He has no official yeah. standing. He is not on the So all that is just rumors. He's looking after yes. his constituents. Yes. No, but as an MP in a FUTU, in the, the, the scheme of things in the university, what kind of leverage does he have, if any? Well, uh, he has been at the center of this whole uh, issue. Because uh, at one point, when a private uh, person, Supiko Ayala, took uh, the matter to court, citing some governing infractions within the university, uh, he served as a lawyer. And he says that as an MP of the uh, constituency, he has an interest in the university. And so to that extent, he will play okay. some role to ensure that things are done the way they okay. ought to be done. Mr. Ernest Edu Azurtiga, PRO of the University of Winneba, University of Education, Education Winneba. Thank you for coming on the show, giving us a little more clarity on the brouhaha, and we hope things will settle soon on that level. <laughs> We've Thank had the much. PRO of the University of Education, Winneba. This is Captured by Women. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back from the break. I am Nansata Yakubu. The Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development has announced a closed season on fishing in Ghana. This period is to be from May 15th to June 15th. Already there are a lot of dissension from a lot of quarters. Why is this so? Last year, a similar announcement caused a lot of protests from fishermen, from other artisanal fishermen, and then from scientists and other stakeholders. Joining us in the studio to discuss this is Professor Francis K.E. Nunu, Chief Director, Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development. Prof, you are welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. So, Prof, we hear the scientists, experts, and stakeholders are all saying that this is not a good time to close off fishing. Yeah. Why is the ministry bent on making sure that this ban comes into effect? Okay, so thank you very much, viewers, uh, and thank you, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, we have a situation where our fishes have, over the years, in the past decade, seen a trend of decline. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, by scientific analysis, if your catch goes below 10%, of the highest maximum catch, then uh, your, your fishery will collapse totally. As at now, our fishery, as at last year, was about between 12 to 14 percent of the highest catch. So which means that we are almost towards the 10 percent. So it, uh, we need to do something. So for the past many years, we've been trying to reduce illegal fishing. Our fishers are fishing with so many obnoxious chemicals and poisons, grenades, bombs, and uh, nets of small mesh size, catching babies of fish, pregnant women, and all that. Pregnant women? Pregnant, pregnant fish. fishes. fishes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> I like that one, so that it will, it will bring in conversation. So we essentially been destroying the fish stock and fishing down, fishing down. So we've gotten to a point where Fishers go to sea and they get very low catch. They are ending up with a lot of uh, debts because they borrow to fix their nets. They go and they don't get anything. So as a ministry, our mandate is to regulate the fishery. And what we've been doing is to increasingly be talking to them, increasingly be arresting some people who go wrong, etc. We don't want to continue arresting everybody. In the end, we'll be arresting all fishers. So in 2015, as a ministry, we came up with a fisheries management plan 
the Fisheries Management Plan of Ghana, mm -hmm. and this has been gazetted. It's been approved by cabinet, by parliament, everything. And in that plan, it states that every year we have a close fishing season from 2015, between two to four months. Every year is in there. Okay. Prof. So, okay. Prof, the, 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 this thing is subject of uh, some discussion yes. because who are the stakeholders who are in this uh, plan? Yes. Were the artisanal farmers part of it? Yeah, artisanal in, in the artisanal fishers. Artisanal yeah, they fishers? Were, they were part of it. You know what happens is that they are, formed, they are in various associations. We have the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council. Exactly. That represents all the canoe fishers. Mm -hmm. With the Ghana Inshore Fishers Association, they represent the artisanal, uh, the inshore boats, the inshore boats. Then we have the uh, Ghana Industrial Trawlers Association representing trawlers. Then we have Ghana Tuna Association representing the, uh, the tuna, tuna whatever. Now they have their own executives and all that. Then we have what we call the National uh, F uh, Fishery Associations of Ghana, where all the associations meet. And they have what we call NAFAC. They have their, that's that umbrella body of all fishes yeah. associations. Okay, so all these associations are there, and we deal with reps of these associations. Uh, we have over 140,000 fishes, artisanal fishes. Mm. We have uh, was over... There? Actually, we, we, we had was closer to almost 200,000. Yes, yeah. but on paper, we have okay. about 140 mm. artisanal fishes. We have... Uh, you know, over 14,000 canoes. Mm -hmm. During the stakeholder process, was yeah. there any opposition to these dates for closure? Yes, okay. So last year, 2018, when uh, we wanted to have the close season and it was opposed, uh, we were told to postpone it and have, have it the next year and continue engagement. So we continued with them. We had various meetings across the country, but often, we will not meet the ordinary man. We always meet their representatives. Yes. They have regional representatives. They have district representatives. They have national representatives. Yeah. So we meet these reps of them. And what we think is that uh, when we discuss, the information probably do not trickle down very well as we expect. Okay, so we met with them, and then we even proposed that they bring us their yes, own dates. Their dates. Yes. yes, that's what I was going yes. to ask yes. about. Yes, we, we said, okay, this, we gave them the scientific evidence. The evidence says that we have, uh, for the pelagic fishes, we have the peak around July, August, September. Mm -hmm. They all, you know, it's a multi-species fishery. What we need to understand is that it's not a one species. Yes. Yeah. So all the fishes don't do the same thing all the time. Even we humans, people do things some early morning, some afternoon. The same with fishes. They have their own time for like what things. Like what things? For reproductive <laughs> activities, yeah. it varies, okay, yeah. among them. But the majority spawn July, August, September. So, so this ban, if I can just interrupt you, yes, it ahead. would cover most the species? Yeah, most of the pelagic species. The surface ones. The surface ones. Yes, but obviously. then the others... And then the, what I'm trying to explain is that we have demersal species yes. who also spawn at different times of the year. And what I'm trying and to find out, does mm -hmm. that mean that ideally you need several bands, several close seasons? Ideally, we need several close seasons and ideally it should be not for only one month. Mm. It should be for at least up to four months. In other countries, they do up to that. But that, uh -huh. that, but that will be survival, disaster. And that's yes. a disaster. Yeah. So as a ministry, what we said, that okay, initially we want all of them to close at the same month, all fleets, mm -hmm. all fleets to close at the same month. Mm. But with all the agitations and things, we said, okay, this year, you, the various associations, give us your date that yeah. you are able to close the fishery. Okay, so they came up, they wrote a letter, signed, and I have copies of the all, letters. All the associations. The associations are under the umbrella body, NAFAC. Mm -hmm. So NAFAC wrote to us and mm -hmm. even indicated the letter okay. in the letter. So, yes, so I, I have don't have that, unfortunately, that particular letter okay. I don't have. So you got all great. these documents from <laughs> so yeah. the letter. So you yes. said NAFAC, NAFAC, they gave you their they dates. They gave the, the, the letter. Which, what, what, what dates did they want? They even initially wanted, uh, uh, they initially wanted April to May. And then uh, they wanted June to July. Yes. And then they came back and changed it to May, June. 
Okay. They, so they wrote two sets of letters. And in the letters, they indicated the various consultations okay. they've had with the various okay. associations. So was it scientific-based, their date choice? Do you know? No, they, 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 we, we don't know what don't it was based on. Okay. But as a ministry, what we, we uh, what informed our decision is that if you choose for them like we chose last year, yes. last year we wanted a peak, August, you have problem policing it. So we wanted something that it will be voluntary compliance. They will comply voluntarily so that it will not be very difficult to police. And also for us as a ministry, when you, you know, natural science, you remove a little pressure on the population. It's better than not removing okay. so any pressure at all. At all. My question, I, I, I had a question, but I need you to explain something before I go on. Mm. You said that there are different stakeholders, the trawlers, the NAFAG, the canoe, yes. The, yes. So everybody has a time that they should or they shouldn't. So if NAFAG has written, and if you are banning for just the May to 15, doesn't mean that it's some people who cannot go, but others can go. Or whether you are NAFAG, whether you are trawler, whether everybody's at the same time, since the fishes behave differently. Okay. Do you fish for different seasons, for clothes Precisely. for different fishes? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. what we need to get before All my right. next question. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, like I said earlier on, I said ideally, for greater success mm -hmm. and for the stocks to rebuild, it would be good for everybody to stop fishing at the same time. And that's what we wanted last year. But uh, it wasn't possible. In our engagement, they indicated that no, they can't do that. So they would like to go at different times. They would say, okay, each of the associations dialogue with NAFAC, which is the umbrella body. Mm -hmm. All of you are under NAFAC. So go meet together, have your engagement, give us the minutes and the documentation of your whatever. Yeah. And then arrive as a consensus. Let NAFAC then write to us that these are the dates for the various categories. So they met and wrote to us that tuna are going to go January 1st to 28th February. Okay. And tuna complied. Good. The, all the tuna boats did not go, generate to whatever. Mm -hmm. Then in the same letter they wrote, artisanal fishers, we have agreed to go 15th uh, May to 15th June. That is the canoe canoe. Mm -hmm. That is when they go, okay. plus the inshore boats. Yeah. So artisanal includes inshore boats and canoes. They will go 15th May to 15th June. Then trawlers, those going for the bottom of fishes, yes. mm -hmm. trawlers will also go Two months, they, they accepted to go two months, like the tuna. They will be off July from 1st first, from first August to 30th September. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. All right. So All we right. think that this one is from them. Yes. So, so if their own membership question. will accept, then it's good. Prof, prof, my question now is, the executive secretary of the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Association. Is the president. Ni, <laughs> ni, you know him, Chirekwanda. Near Near Chirkwanda. Chirkwanda. Yeah, 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 yeah. He says that the canoe fishermen were not consulted for this May 15th to June 15th. What they are looking forward to is actually 1st July. He said they want to go in July because the scientists are telling them that if they even close off this season, this one that you are going to close off doesn't That's impact the their impact. That is not going to give an impact. So we need you to respond because it looks like they are the ones really agitating for this uh, current closure, which will impact them not to happen. And, and you know the, 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 the scale of the number of people in that industry. I mean, that are you impacted. Have the, the, yes, you have the numbers. So with that kind of, are you going to renegotiate? Is the ministry still going to go ahead? How legitimate are their concerns? OK, thank you very much. We, after the NAFA wrote to us, mm -hmm. we didn't only just take their, uh, their letter. Which you didn't bring. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, I'll get it to you. <laughs> you give me your email or yeah. phone number. <laughs> Today, if I ask you sit here, I can even call and they'll pick it Please for call me. and you'll yes, we'll be grateful. Yes, yes. <laughs> During the break, I'll call and they'll pick it for me. Yes. So after the letters had come in, we, uh, we organized a national stakeholders meeting okay. at TEMA. And that stakeholders meeting is... is uh, uh, it's trending on social media. In fact, it's on uh, uh, YouTube right now. Okay. We have put it on YouTube. So okay. it's there for everybody to see. Almost everybody that matters in fishery was at Ntema, Nafak Hall, okay. on 5th February, okay. from 2 to 6 p.m. Four hours. Four hours. Big chiefs, 
uh, big and small from all the regions, MMDCs, all the associations, including the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council. Okay. They were there and they spoke. And they accepted. A consensus was built, the MPs and everybody. How about you know, the we fishermen? We even sat The fishermen, the fishermen were there. That's what he's saying. All the chief fishermen from across <laughs> the coastal <laughs> area were there. They were all there. It was a big gathering. And they all spoke, even before the ministry spoke. And they all affirmed that they accept these dates. And then the minister spoke and said, since you have given to us, we bless it. In fact, uh, Nana Kobna and Katia and all that, Nana Mbra, where Cape Coast mm -hmm. chief was the chairman for the occasion. They were all there. MPs were there. Parliamentary Select Committee was there. You know, I can name them. So what has happened between yes. that stakeholder meeting okay, and the Okay, so that was now. February when everything was done. Then just, uh, when we were just about going out to announce, after we've done all the whatever, one day I was there at the office and then the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council came to, came to me personally. I was afraid the minister wasn't there. So I was the next, they came to me and then they said, uh, uh, they are just from the scientific and technical working group meeting and the meeting, at the meeting, they showed them the facts and they think that uh, the July will give them better results. The Canoe Fishermen Association, since it doesn't look like they are going to go with the, the May 15th, because they seem to be, is it possible to then leave them out? As you said, it will, you can say, okay, they can go, and no. maybe the other people in their group <laughs> won't go, or how are you going to negotiate to bring them round to, to, to the bigger picture? Yeah, we have not broken engagements with them, okay. and I think that they are still, although this is they sound, they are supposed to be Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council, representing all of them. Even among them, they are members, quite a large number of them, over 70%, are not in agreement with them. They are not in agreement with their leadership. Okay. Yeah, they are not in agreement with their leadership. And uh, if you go across the country, Western regions, Elmina, this, that, Central, and all that, Volta, Greater Accra, quite a lot of people are ready to comply. And they are even calling for it. In fact, this closes in this year. It's a demand-driven thing. They are calling for it. Because last year, when we said uh, we we're going to close, some of the arguments that, oh, they get bumper harvest in August. They get bumper harvest in August. So in August, there is going to be bumper harvest. So August came, and we didn't see one bumper. fish. So we are saying that we can't keep delaying this policy. This policy is due expiring 2019. You like showing us this. <laughs> yes, because this is what has been whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and then this one too is the, what, the state of the stock. Yeah. Where it's gone, 2019, it's gone down. Yeah. We need to start doing something gradually for it to lift yeah. up. Oh. You know, so these are some of the little things okay. we are doing. We are not doing only closes in. Uh -huh. We are increasing enforcement. The Navy and the Marine Police has been sensitized. The Fisheries Enforcement to Unit tackle the overfishing to aspect tackle the it. overfishing aspect, the illegal the fishing, illegal, and the, the dynamite. The and the dynamite and this. If we are caught, the sanctions are applied. So at this time, this is heightened time, high security for these things. If you are caught, the law will deal with you. Professor Anunu, yes, thank please. you very much for coming up, captured by Oh, is that all? <laughs> yeah, that's all. <laughs> you had a lot more to say, but unfortunately, we ran out of time. <laughs> We've been discussing thank the you. upcoming close season <laughs> propositioned by the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development. With us in the studio has been Professor Francis K.E. Nunu. We'll be right back after the break. Oh, oh, oh. So ladies, what have been your high points in today's discussion? My high point has been the umpires at the University of uh, Education whenever, where Professor Avoke is using all the channels possible to him, but he needs to actually see the governing council and present himself like all the other lecturers have uh, been to put in their petitions and they have been reinstated. So he needs to follow the book. It's not just the fact that he was former vice chancellor so the law would not apply to him as the governing council demands. So, yes. And students should not um, lose out of all of this. I mean, they should not be affected. Their career, their acad academic uh, paths yeah. should not be affected. That has been my high point. Yeah. I, I would say that um, 
I'm kind of looking looking forward to big fish. <laughs> big, yes. fish. <laughs> big fish. Tuna. I like fish. <laughs> Tuna. Uh, what did the man say? Pelagics. 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 Right. That one. Those ones. The small small ones. Kita school boys. Anchovies. All that. Yes. I'm really looking forward, and I'm hoping that they will, this impasse about what date and what date not because. It's in the national interest, and we think I think we need to do this. So it was a very exciting that the director was take, took us through what is really going on and how hard they are working to make sure we have fish in our diet. Mm -hmm. yeah. My high point was also centers around the fishing season and the ban. My high point was actually that it appears that they've done a lot of stakeholder engagement this time round. I mean, I haven't followed it closely in f previous years, but it sounds the ministry has taken all the right steps. So I'm hoping that. The, well, what was that organization? The, the Ghana Canoe can, 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 Council, yeah. yeah. Get a consensus so they can know in good time. So if the ban is going to happen, because overfishing is a problem all over the world. Everyone yeah. else is suffering. And we do have to have a ban, but it should be tailored to adjust to the needs of the actual people in that industry. I don't think the authorities can just put a impose blanket. Impose on them. Yes, impose it. So I was I, excited to hear that they've had such a good stakeholder mm -hmm. forum. Viewers, make a date to join us same time next week on Captured by Women. <laughs>